Welcome to episode two of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca, and I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And if you haven't seen it, go check out the blooper reel from episode one. We are very thankful for all our sponsors, but those blooper reels keep getting longer and longer. John, I think we can fit in a whole new set of sponsors. We may have to. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And, and quite frankly, Joe, that's the only reason why I do this show is just to produce bloopers. And you always make me laugh. Intentionally, God, God knows we're more, good at often, that. more often unintentionally, but either way, comedy gold sitting right next to me. <laughs> Rail Talk is proudly sponsored. Does that mean pr- they're proud to sponsor or we're proud to have them as a sponsorship? I always wondered that when people said proudly sponsored. Regardless, we are very proud to have tailor-made sales as one of our sponsors, one of our leading sponsors, our flagship sponsors, because they're the world, worldwide leader in thoroughbred sales, marketing, and horse care. They've been family owned and operated since 1976. If you know the Taylor family, you know they do things the right way. And they're honest and transparent. They're good with, with clients, with customers, with the media. We've had Mark Taylor on our shows a bunch. They care for their customers, their team members, and horses like their family. And they deliver smiles through service. That's, you know, that's, I love that. They, you know, give us service with a smile and make the service make us smile. I always enjoy that. And they have fun striving for excellence. They always look for a better way to do things. And they had a big, big success at the Facing Tipton Horses of Racing, Racing Ace Sale, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. They sold Crypto Mo for $500,000, third highest price for the day. And they were just under $2 million in total sales for TaylorMade at the Horses of Racing Ace Sale. And at the Facing July Sale, there were over $3.3 million in total sales for TaylorMade. John, you know, TaylorMade, and you can you, you can attest to this, you know, being part of a family that's been steeped in racing for a long time, you know, they have that family reputation. They have they, they have success over years and years and generations and generations. And you mentioned last week that you guys are selling Wonder Wheel at Facing Tipped in November, and you're selling her through TaylorMade as the consigner. Can you just talk about why you made that decision to go with them? And, and Joe, it wasn't an easy uh, decision to, you know, to go ahead and have Wonder Wheel retire. But it was a very easy decision to have Taylor made represent us um, to sell the horse in the um, Night of the Stars coming up in November. And you mentioned some of the great qualities that, that the Taylor boys have. One of the things I think that, that, that I need to mention as well is they're innovative. They're not afraid to try new things. They're not tr- afraid to try, you know, an RNA sale at their own pavilion. Uh, they're not afraid to try to have the, f- the fast pass and and basically schedule when you can come and look at your horses at the uh, at, at a you know a specific sale. Um, and just everything from you know even the little the little things like when you come to their you know to the consignment, um, somebody comes up to you and asks you if you want a lemonade at Saratoga. I mean, and and just little things like that that you don't even think about. But but as you're there. Um, you're like, wow, that was really refreshing. Now I'm ready to go look at these horses again. And, and I'm sure it, there's a lot of marketing that goes into it, a lot of uh, psychology that goes into it. But they are always on the cutting edge of, of innovation. So I'm really pleased that we're a 30 plus year um, client of TaylorMade. I think, you know, Duncan started, uh, you know, our relationship and, and then it went to his brothers, Frank and Ben. And now we've been with Mark for a number of years and, and really any of the guys, any of the, the Taylor brothers, um, you can call anytime and, and they give you just tremendous insight and information. And they're not afraid to say, I don't know, it's a great question. Let me get back to you. So when we decided we were going to have Wonder Wheel retire and ultimately sell, they came to us, the Taylor boys came to us and said, here's the marketing pitch that we want to do. And I was like, marketing pitch? She's a champion. What do you mean marketing pitch? You don't need to market her at all. And they gave us um, an 11 point marketing plan of what things they're going to do for Wonder Wheel. And I'm telling you, Joe, it's not just because it's Wonder Wheel. I think any horse um, that is in that sale, they're coming at it and looking at it. How are we strategically going to be able to market this horse to the best of our ability? So hats off to Taylor Made. Yeah. And with them, your family, and they're going to do a great job with Wonder Wheel as they do with all of their consignments. And you can check them out at tailormadefarm.com. So today is like Christmas Eve for horse players, for racing fans, anybody from upstate New York or Massachusetts or downstate New York or pretty much all along the eastern seaboard. We look forward to tomorrow. We're recording this on Wednesday. I think the show is going to come out on Friday. But opening day of Saratoga is tomorrow. Could not be more excited for the meet. It really feels like I always think of this line. There's a movie, 42, and it's about Jackie Robinson. It's about Branch Rickey and the Brooklyn Dodgers. And they're talking about opening day of 
the baseball season. And Branch Rickey goes, I love opening day, all future, no past. That's what Saratoga feels like to me, that that opening day. Doesn't matter what happened the rest of the year. If you're a horse player, you put all those bad beats behind you. You dive into the first day's card. You hope to make it right. I hope the worm, worm turns in Saratoga. If you're a trainer and you haven't been having a great year, you've been going through a little bit of a, a slump, you're, you've been on a schneid for a little bit, you bring your best stock to Saratoga and the possibilities are endless. It just feels like a rebirth every single summer. And I think what's so fun about it too is it's a, kind of a little bit of a reunion grounds for people. There are a lot of people in racing who don't necessarily live close to the track up at Saratoga, but they see these people, they see their friends every year up at the spa. And it's just such a joyous occasion for people to get back together around their shared passion that is racing. John, I mean, you've been going to Saratoga slightly longer than me. What are some of the things that stand out to you and what makes this summer, that, that summer meet so special? Well, Joe, I think it, it really comes down to a couple of things. Number one is it's Disneyland for horse players, horse owners, people who follow the sport. Um, you just you're, 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 you go there and everything is exactly the same as it was last year, five years ago, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, you go back in time, basically, um, from Main Street, you know, right downtown in, in Saratoga Springs, uh, all the way to, you know, the, the breakfast spots that you get, um, places you get your coffee and your actual physical daily racing form, like the actual print copy of it, not not on your on your iPad. And you just feel like that if you didn't know what year and 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 you know, century it was, you very well could be back in the 50s or 60s or 70s in the heyday of racing um, it, because it, it, it's just, it just feels magical. It feels like that. Um, and the other thing that I really love about Saratoga is definitely the baby races because uh, every single race, people are gunning for those maiden races and stake races at Saratoga. Um, whenever we look at catalog pages, when you see that a horse placed or won a stake at Saratoga, uh, you know, that immediately stamps them as, as a contender um, and, and, and as a rising star, for lack of a better term. You know, that, that's, where, that's where a lot of the top horses, that's where their, uh, you know, their, their careers start. And, and uh, people look back and say, I was there when. Yeah, no, exactly. And then the purses are better than ever. The New York bread purses are better than ever. It's just going to be a great summer. I think in a little bit, we're going to talk to one of the one of the kings of Saratoga. No, not Angel Cordero, but we got Steve Bitt coming right around the corner. We're going to get into the Saratoga meet and play more. Rail Talk is sponsored by Facing Tipton. We talked a lot last week about the Facing Tipton July sale. The next big one on the calendar is the Facing Tipton Saratoga sale. We cannot wait for that. I think we're actually going to have Anna Seitz on the show in a couple of weeks. We're going to do an on-scene show upstate at Saratoga by the Sales Pavilion. We're so stoked about that. I mean, John, has a show ever been around for this little amount of time and already had an on-scene show I think the demand is just overwhelming, but 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 in, in all seriousness, Facing Tipton, the sales pavilion is a great, great location for the show. The sale, the Saratoga sale, one of the most prestigious yearling sales in the world is August 7th and August 8th. I believe we're going to do the show the Friday before, which is August 4th. Still working out some details on that, but we're looking forward to that. As I said, we'll probably have Anna on, maybe even Boyd Browning on as well. So we're definitely looking forward to that. It was a great Facing Tipton July sale. Uh, there was a yearling by Authentic. Who, pay, who who cost four hundred seventy five thousand dollars? Who topped the sale? A couple of horses by Good Magic. As we see the the Derby buzz continue to you know build for Good Magic after he had the Derby winner and Mage uh, followed that authentic yearling. But we didn't mention this that much last week, John. The Facing Tipton Horses of Racing Age sale was the day before. It was earlier this week, and the that that's a sale that's grown in importance over time. And I think that the the, the uh, just the sphere of horses of racing age sales continue to expand. But let me just read off some of the some of the uh, the price tags that we got from the Facing Tipton horses of racing age sale. At the top, at the very top, was a, a filly by Tappet named Free Look. I think we we know this filly. She was a turf horse um, that was bought by Chad Schumer for Blue Diamond Stud for five hundred fifty thousand dollars. Horse named Mally Moo went for five hundred fifty thousand dollars to Steve Steve Young. There was a Hunter Valley Farm purchase for five hundred thousand dollars. Cryptomo, as we mentioned, the Taylor Made consigned. Rita Fine sold for four hundred fifty, four forty five, four hundred, three hundred eighty thousand, three hundred fifty thousand. 
John, you did not see these kind of numbers at the Horses of Racing Age sales until very recently. And I think FASIC has been at the forefront of that with this standalone sale. There are a lot of other sales companies that will like tack on a Horses of Racing Age portion sometimes to other sales. And those are having success as well. But FASIC has been, you know, like I said, at the forefront of this. What, you know, as an owner, as a breeder, as a purchaser, what were your reactions from some of those sale prices at the at the FASIC Horses of Racing Age sale? Joe, I was completely shocked. I was completely shocked at just how well these horses were selling. And, and quite frankly, as much as I like to think that I can read the tea leaves, you know, as well, if not better than anybody in the industry, I was way off. We have, you know, half a dozen to, to 10 horses of racing age that we were going to put in a sale. And I guessed wrong. I put them into the August sale, the, the, the digital sale, um, thinking that that would be a better forum you know, for the horses that we had. And, and I was dead wrong. I mean, you look at, you mentioned some of the prices of, of horses that were going and, and I did a little analysis on my own and said, okay, what do I think these horses are going to sell for? And I was, you know, again, normally I like to think that we're pretty close. I was way off. I mean, the, the fact that, that, uh, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, Malimu who came in and, and, you know, won the Penn Oaks, but it was a five horse field and got on top and, and won easily, you know, $12,000 yearling sold for $550,000. That's crazy. That just shows you how good of a sale it was and how strong Fazig is in, in this marketplace. Um, there was another horse that was a, a uh, I'm going to butcher its name, Gerwitztermer, uh, which was the second horse in the ring. I know I butchered it. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, that was a hard one. That, that was a twenty five. Sounds like a wine. That sounds like a wine that I can't afford at a restaurant. They give you the book full of wines, and I'll, I, I, I want it, but I'm too afraid to butcher it, so I'm not going right. to order it. So I'm not going to order. I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the Boone's Mill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but but the horse sold is a collective <laughs> Boone's cult. So Boone's Farm. Sorry, I want to say Boone's Mill. That, that, that's even worse. You it's even more watered cheap down. liquors on this show, not with me on, on your case. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. It's even more watered down. Anyway, this this horse that I can't pronounce the name sold for twenty five hundred dollars as a yearling, won a restricted auction uh, maiden race. Uh, Churchill again went wire to wire and sold for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I just I'm scratching my head on some of these, and 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 I'm sure these horses are going to go on and do wonderful things, but they were just so over uh, inflated. I thought from a pricing standpoint, and and again that shows the strength that uh, of the venue that that uh, you know that that Fazig brings to the table. Um, I have to say one other thing, just as a Giants fan, uh, as a football Giants fan, there was the horse, the first horse in the ring of the horses of racing age sale was named Gettleman, um, who was a bad maiden um, and sold for 70,000. I was so glad to see that that horse sold. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> we're trying to get rid of Gettleman, uh, you know, in so many different ways. So good luck to the new owners. But I would, you know, Godolphin named this horse Gettleman, I'm assuming after the former Giants, uh, you know, head man. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll never forget when uh, Dave. And honestly, he he drafted Daniel Jones, who seems like he's actually okay. But I'll never forget his press conference talking about his confidence, confidence in him. And he has like the most heavy, but also obscure Boston accent I've ever heard in my life. It where he kept fake. calling him. It sounds fake. He he kept calling him his Kuwata back. His Kuwata. <laughs> back uh, i wanted to i wanted him to spell that for me anyway we're getting we're getting off track here but yeah the phasing sale w was was a huge success and i see this at west point too honestly i see more of an increased demand for ready-made horses because you know we sell a lot of yearlings and, and sell a lot of two-year-olds as well but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of expense and a lot of work that has to be put in to get those horses to the races if you can buy a ready-made horse who's in form in training and you just pluck them into a new barn and send them out there i think it makes a lot of sense the way this market is increasing and like i said i think Facebook has done a really good job marketing this sale not so much on last week's show because we didn't mention it we only talked about the year <laughs> but in retrospect it, it you know it has become a marked date on the calendar for a lot of buyers and, and Joe, the, the other thing, just and we'll go into the next topic. This is the way the marketplace should be. The marketplace actually should put a premium on horses that have made it to the racetrack and are running, as opposed to you know the blue sky unknown potential um, of people spending just a shit ton of money on unproven horses that aren't even going to hit the racetrack for you know for six months to to a year and a half. So I, I think the market is starting to get back into sync um, by putting a premium on some of these existing you know run horses. Um, but man, I was just shocked at how well. Uh, those horses sold at the phase of horses racing HL. Rail Talk is sponsored by our friends at the Green Group. And I do mean that, mean that our friends at the Green Group. It was great to see Len out at the track on Saturday with 
I guess, John as well. Web Slinger, I thought, ran well in the Belmont Derby. He had a winner with Bouncer. So shout out to you guys and DJ Stable, first of all. But the Green Group is the leading tax horse firm in the in the country. Like there's nobody else you should go to before them for all of your tax needs when it comes to horse racing. If you're not using the Green Group to help you with taxes, you're probably probably, most likely, definitely paying too much money in taxes. They have over 800 clients in the horse business. See, that doubled. Len had to had to take me aside. And I was still saying four or 500. Now they have eight, over 800 clients in the horse business. So I'm not going to say it's all because of my beautiful ad reading, but I got to think that that has a little bit to do with it. But in all seriousness, Len Green and the Greek Group, they know the horse business because they're successful industry insiders and owners. They've been owners for more than 40 years, have owned some of the most some of the top horses in racing and breeding. And they know two things better than most, horse business and accounting in the Venn diagram. It's like right there. They're both on top of each other with the Green Group. And Len consults with potential clients for free. He reviews their last returns. If he can't find savings, he'll tell you that you're doing great, but he usually finds savings. And a consultation with Len is more fun than that. He's a leading voice in entrepreneurship. He taught at the Babson School. He authored a book called The Entrepreneur's Playbook, which is I'm not rich enough to read yet, but eventually I think I will get to that level where I'm allowed to read that book. And he's owned over 30 successful businesses. Talking with Len is like getting a mini MBA. And that's just one of the one of the benefits of talking to Len, as John can attest. But we appreciate Len and all of his support. And if you want to find out more about how they can help you save taxes, go to greenco.com. So at this time, right after talking about Saratoga, we are so thrilled to bring in, to me, the king of Saratoga. Angel Cordero might have something to say about that. But to me, he's the guy who everybody revolves around all summer at Saratoga, for better or worse. You know him from his critically acclaimed At The Races show on Sirius XM. And guy who really is the reason that I'm in racing and still in racing to this day, Steve Bick. Welcome to the show. Joe. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for, I don't know, 18, 19 years, uh, <laughs> knowing that a day would come that there would be a, a Joe Bianca show and a John Green show. I've only been, John, I've only been looking forward to that for about seven years. Well, I, I know that I've just been Joe's sidekick for a number of years. So I, I, I say it's the Joe Bianca show as well. All right. You said it because I was going to say it if you didn't say it, but you said it. But Steve, <laughs> listen, you know, we, 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 we've been wanting to have you on our show for a long time. Not going not, not gonna to explain why you weren't on the old show, but we're so glad to have you on this show. And, you know, like I said, you you are a big reason that I'm into racing. You know, you you really took me under your wing early on. For anybody who doesn't know the story, you know, I met up with Steve when I was like 18 years old at the Belmont Stakes, went up to Saratoga the following summer and met him. And, you know, he just taught me so much about racing. And so many of my formative years in the sport were because of Steve and in the presence of Steve. And when I see, Joe, what, what you and what Brian spent and uh, Brian D. DiNardo and, you know, others, uh, you know, that that uh, were part of that scene uh, in the aughts, uh, what what you've all gone on to do. It, it, there's some real satisfaction in, in, in that for me. I mean, when I was a when I was in consumer packaged goods and a manager uh, for Procter and Gamble, uh, you're taught that uh, there's no there's no better contribution uh, to you know, to your industry uh, than to moving young people forward and uh, you know fostering their interests. So f- for me, I, there's as much satisfaction in seeing success uh, of, of people like you uh, as there is for whatever I've you know managed to achieve for myself uh, with the show. And Steve, I don't know if you realize, but you actually launched my career in broadcasting as well. Um, you know, we both both went to Patriot League schools. You went to Colgate and I went to Lehigh. You started out, um, you know, in your late 40s. And, and when I came onto the scene with the podcast, it was like I was almost 50 um, doing it. And uh, and and the whole reason why I got into, you know, doing podcasts and broadcasting is I was like, well, if Bic could make a living at this, then anybody can. So I'd want to go ahead and, and, and jump in. But no, but, but all kidding aside, you, you were you were like, the, the the godfather of all of us that, that came into this industry and and have been promoting it um, basically you know kind of kind of you you were the trailblazer trailblazer for all of us that's, that's very kind yeah, I was gonna say- yeah. I was going to say, John, he's an, he's an inspiration to you. If you start in your late 40s and you ride the right coattails, anything can happen. So, John, that's a, that's, that's a teachable moment for you. That's exactly um, exactly right. Thank you, John. <laughs> but we were just 
<laughs> we, you know, so, we, so we got all sorts of stories. Um, but the, the summer I remember the most, and I, Steve was nice enough to let me stay with him when I would be up at Saratoga working at the Carolina barbecue. And the summer I remember was the 06 summer. That was the closest I've ever gotten to living in a frat house. So, John, you know, we you, you offered earlier today that I could stay with you, you know, potentially if I come up to Saratoga, we're going to do the live show at the sale. Steve can give you some, some words of, of warning <laughs> about yeah. letting me do that, because, Steve, I mean, what just what do you remember for that summer? I, I remember the nickname, the Love Shack. Uh, that that uh, is, is, is part of it. Um, we we uh uh, there was a certain point between uh, me and, and Tina and and uh, you and and uh, uh, and then Sammy and and uh, what was her name uh, Jen. Um, it was it was like Saturday night at Roseland. Everybody had a partner, and uh, uh, we, it, there, there are so many fun aspects. You, you, and, and anybody that summers. It doesn't have to be summer. It can be winter at, at Oaklawn. It can be winter at Gulfstream. Uh, what, what that, what that, what you got to experience uh, there, Joe, is, is you know racetrack camaraderie where uh, you know everywhere you know starting uh, it's it's as we say Erev Saratoga. Uh, it's Wednesday night before Saratoga starts, and there's those groups of, of people that are that are from all over the racetrack, uh, exercise riders and, uh, uh, you know, per- personnel that work uh, in the in the offices uh, and, and, you know, on uh, either on the back stretch or on the front side. You know, there, there's there's you know, people that come in to work food service, the concessionaires and. It's very. It, there's a certain camaraderie and and a certain exhaustion that uh, everybody experiences. And, and one part of it is that you know you were there for for Saratoga six days a week, and it, it, it's hard to believe. Jay Pridman told me because Delmar had gone from six to five before we did at Saratoga. Jay had said to me, "You're not going to believe how beneficial it is, and and what that." You know, going to five days, uh, how how much easier it makes it. But when we when you work six days out of seven on the track, it it's it's a frenetic pace. It just it, it's it's absolute full throttle every day, every minute. The off day, you have to take care of everything that you don't have time for uh, the rest of of the week. And you know the you know the nights out or the late nights handicapping. You know all of us sitting in the kitchen handicapping until about midnight. You know, and then up early. I mean, Joe Joe is also roomed with me on the road, so he knows uh, you know that I, I I'll be up at three thirty four o'clock to you know handicap or or write up a card. Uh, it drove him not just handicap, not just handicap. Print out pretty much the entire daily racing form, start to finish, at four thirty in the morning when I got to be up and working concession in an hour for twelve hours. That's the other thing about Steve; he's old school. He brings the stack, the the thoroughgraph stack, and the racing form. I mean, it's he, he's he's a purist in that way. So, Steve, since since you are known for it, and and our listeners are are anxious to hear, what did you feel about the? I'm going to pick the race that I'm in, uh, the two year old Philly Stake race on on opening day, the Skylerville. I, I got to be honest, I, I'm behind. Uh, I'm behind already, uh, having <laughs> having having been away, um, having been away until uh, Saturday, actually Sunday even. So I have not. It's funny. I've looked more at Friday's card because we're in a race. Uh, on on Friday, we're in the fifth with Scherzando. So I actually well, tell us about was tell us about that one. Tell us about the the, the fifth watching, on, on Friday. I, I think he's got a huge shot. He's second choice, nine to two. Uh, I think everybody, he's one of these horses. I think a lot of uh, handicapper types are are gonna you know pick for minor awards. But you look at the you look at the field. Um, there, there's there he's the you know quote unquote he's the fastest uh, coming in. But I I I like us uh, on Friday, Scherzando. He's he's gonna be in the outside. The open air outside box where the air is fresh and clear, the Marty McGee. Uh, yep. So, I, so, I, so, so I, listeners, I like you, you heard it here first. Steve Bick is guaranteeing a win his in the fifth race on of Friday. The week. His lock shoe in. in of the week. Right. That's a big shoe. That's, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that, that's what we heard, Steve. That, that, that's what you're I, telling our audience, right? Guaranteed? All right. I, I, I will accept that. Steve, Steve, <laughs> Ad, Steve off, Asmussen uh, does that. That's become that's become a shtick on, on the show, actually. Asmussen <laughs> giving a, a – 
ice cold lock. Uh, and, he, and, and, he's, and he's rarely wrong. I, I got to say, I remember, you know, Steve was talking about how people rely on him for the picks. And it's definitely true because I can attest. I remember when we were working at the Carolina barbecue, he would post like staple or tape his his picks for the day on the outside of the stand. And people would be pissed off if they came by and those picks were not up. And I would just be standing there like slinging sausage or barbecue and being like, well, I handicap too. You don't you want to know my opinions? <laughs> it was a, it was a real inferiority complex for me early on because I, I could fancy myself a handicapper and a scribe. But I wanted to ask you this, and I've always wanted to ask you this, honestly, because you know you've seen it from both angles. Now you've you've been the outsider, you've been you know just doing this as a hobbyist, and now you've been the insider, for lack of a better term, as one of the leading voices in this industry. You know how has this is a general question, but how has your view of the industry shaped? or morphed over time from when you were just doing this as a hobby to now being, like I said, one of the leading voices in the business. Now this, this, this is, this is a proverbial loaded question. The, <laughs> that's what it shows about. Yeah, maybe the, loaded the, question. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that can shape a path forward is dialogue and, uh, you know, mutual understanding. Uh, and and respect, uh, and of course this is true. This is true of every challenge that we face in in society. Uh, but as as Sid Fernando and I discuss regularly, uh, racing is is really a, a an incredible uh, mirror image of of society at large, uh, from, from the economies uh, to the you know to the polarities uh, that are out there. So I, my, my opinion hasn't really changed or, or morphed, per se. Um, my understanding ha- has, has widened. Um, there, there are plenty of things that I find uh, annoying and frustrating about the game, uh, but there, there's just there are too many smart, successful people involved in every area of this sport and this industry for us not to succeed. Uh, the, the biggest problem we've got right now is not internal, it's external. And that's why it's so important for us to all come together. And, I, and, and coming together doesn't mean, you know, just, uh, you know, saying, oh, Heisa, Heisa is the way we all have to get behind Heisa. That, that, that's not, that's not what I, that's not my, my suggestion here. Uh, but we all have to at least be pulling in, in, the, in the same direction and have a, a common uh, cause, essentially, to back. And that has to gird us against critics of the, of the sport uh, that uh, don't understand it, uh, don't even want to understand it. So uh, any, any frustrations or, or, or concerns that I've got uh, don't matter uh, enough for me to, uh, you know, bring them out and, and, and air them. Uh, my, my first priority is for the, the welfare of the sport. And th- that's, that guides my every action. I mean, and that, that, that's, that's a point well taken. And I think we all, you know, whatever criticism we have, we're advocates of the game at our core. And there's no bigger advocate of racing than Steve. Steve's got an early bird dinner reservation. This is honestly past his bedtime. I can't believe he came on this late with us. But Steve, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights. And, and thank you for everything you do for the sport. It's, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Joe, John, uh, thanks for having me and uh, excited for you to have uh, uh, this opportunity. And, and to, you know, again, everybody that you know, some people say, oh, there's so many podcasts, whatever. I don't care how many blogs. I don't care how many, you know, how many advice columns. Uh, it, it, all the all of the contributions that uh, people make uh, is a commitment uh, to the interests of the game. Uh, and so uh, anything that that furthers, uh, you know, the, the cause, anything that, uh, you know, helps people enjoy the game more, learn and understand the game better, uh, be more excited for it uh, and, and 
all all of those elements uh, I, I'm I'm for. And when it's with uh, somebody that uh, you know I, I think the world of and and knew was going to be a, a tremendous success uh, in in Joe and uh, in you know one of the uh, one of the really one of the families that uh, help sustain the game in the greens. Uh, uh, and Len and, and, and John and, and Lois, uh, the late uh, Mrs. Green, uh, you know, the, the fact that you guys uh, put this together uh, and, and are going, uh, running with it, uh, it'll be a big success because uh, it's in very good hands. So thanks for having me. We'll see you. We'll see you. Well, John, we'll see you as soon as tomorrow. Perhaps, yeah. As soon as tomorrow, if I'm not up there, you know, Aaron, you go to will be up there to to, to jump in. Uh, you know, hopefully exactly. the paddock and the winner's circle. It, so it's exactly right. Uh, in fact, I don't call him Aaron. You go to anymore. I call him Aaron Green. You should, because <laughs> he, he, as far as my sisters are concerned, he's in the will, so he <laughs> might as well be. Uh, you know, he might as well be a you know a stepchild at this point. But Steve, with all sincerity, you know, we, Joe and I can't thank you enough because not only um, have you been an inspiration for us, but you also even let us come on your show. To help us springboard at this successful podcast, Rail Talk. Um, so, again, we can't thank you enough. And uh, we really look forward to spending some time with you um, up at the Love Shack 2.0. <laughs> Love Thanks. you, buddy. See you soon. <laughs> Thanks a lot, fellas. Good luck this, good luck this week. <laughs> All right. Shout out to my man, my big brother, Steve Bick. And I mean it. You know, there's no way I would be here in this position in racing if it weren't for Steve. He's been a huge influence and a huge help in my career, but also in the careers, as he mentioned, of many young people in racing. I still consider myself a young person, very barely. And I wouldn't <laughs> this is a good job. John's doing the calculations right now. True accountant in his head, try to figure out what the what the median young person age is in race. For racing, I'm young. You know, it's like a, it's, it's like a, I don't know. It's, it's like a golfer. Maybe I'm, I'm like, I'm young for a golfer, you know, it's, but anyway, let's get past that. It's all, it's all relative. It's all relative. Yes. It just depends on who you're well, comparing we, yourself. What we definitely know is that John is not young, despite the fact that he's clearly dyed his hair. Cause you see that his beard is not speaking to his hair at this moment. Um, but anyway, we, we have some stuff to talk about actually in the news. We had, so we wanted to get into this last week, but we had so much fun with Ren and we ran over time that we wanted to get to this this week. Haiza has started like laying down the law and, you know, issuing their fir their first, I would say, major ruling since the ADMC, the anti-doping medication control rules came into effect. And that happened last week where McLean Robertson, Ray Handel and Jonathan Wong, there might have been a couple others, but those were the big names who had gotten handed down two year provisional suspensions for, you know, violating laws and having bylaws and having illegal substances, allegedly, 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 in their horses and post-race samples. Now, so there was a lot of uproar about this in the immediate aftermath and saying that, you know, it's not practical and it's a little unfair off of this one finding to provisionarily, I don't know if that's a rule, that that's a law, but provisionarily suspend someone force them to try to move all of their horses in a short amount of time as the appeal process plays out. I kind of agree with that. But then the appeal process did play out in the case of Ray Handel, where he appealed with his lawyer. They found that there was contamination, reasonable assumption of contamination, and they reversed his suspension. He's free to train horses at Naira Tracks. Naira released a supporting statement saying that he's allowed back on the grounds. But I would defer to John mostly on this. I mean, obviously, I work, well, I work for West Point, so I'm in this arena somewhat, but I don't make the decisions at West Point, I, you know, in terms of moving horses and, and the, you know, obviously we don't have any drug penalties, but just, you know, in, on the backstretch, I'm not really into that world. John is. So, John, you tell me this, like you, you, you're an upstanding guy, you have upstanding trainers, but say supposedly, let's, let's presuppose that one of your trainers had some kind of, illegal substance or banned substance in the horse after from the post-race test. How do you feel about there being a two-year provisional suspension and then the burden of proof being on the trainer to appeal and get that overturned? 
it, it's really an impossible situation for the trainer um, or, or for the covered person in, in this case. And I know that they have ultimate responsibility. And from a legal standpoint, um, basically, they have to oversee everything that's going on. So if somebody, um, you know, contaminates a horse's feed or somebody urinates in a stall and they're an employee of, uh, you know, of that trainer, of that covered person, then it all falls under the umbrella of it has to be, you know, that, that they are the, the you know, the buck stops with them. Um, my big concern is, you know, just the fact that it's an automatic two year suspension and you have to prove yourself innocent. Um, you're, 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 you're deemed guilty and you have to presume, you know, you have to prove yourself innocent, which is obviously the, the, you know, the exact opposite of the way that our legal system is. Um, that being said, I, you know, and I took that stance, um, as of a couple of weeks ago and even a week ago, Joe, but what I was really impressed with, with regarding Haiza was how quickly the split sample got, uh, you know, got, got, uh, you know, got examined and the results came out. So it, it wasn't a situation like it had been in the past where, you know, somebody finds out that they have a, a positive and then there's months that go by before the split sample is even reviewed. And then months go by even longer, um, even more until they get the result and then they see if they can appeal it. it this was pretty damn quick. I mean, this this wow. was five furlong turf sprinter, you know, yeah. kind of kind of reaction time. And if that's going to be the norm, if that's going to be the norm now, then I can see why the presumption of guilt um, is automatic. And then you have to prove yourself innocent as long as they get the split samples back that quickly. And in Ray Handel's case, it happened, you know, to his detriment that in the beginning that he was, you know, immediately found guilty. But then immediately thereafter, like within a couple of business days, um, you know, the split sample result came out and he was exonerated. And as long as that's going to be the case, then I, I feel a little better about the presumption of guilt. I still don't like that that's the automatic situation because there will be a time where, um, things are going to get elongated, the, the timeline is going to get elongated and or somebody big is going to get um, embroiled in this kind of a situation and they're going to start to move horses around. Um, and then and then you really are doing damage to that person's ability to make money. And, and I think there's there's definitely a slippery slope there. Um, but I know from hearing um, Lisa Lazarus. Uh, recommendations and summary today, because it's almost the one year anniversary since HISA was implemented. And um, she gave a presentation to the Breeders' Cup members uh, the, today. And I was really impressed with not only what she said, but also that, Joe, I don't know if you realize this, 99.87% of all races run in North America in, in 2020, excuse me, 2022, were done so without incident. 99, I mean, it's almost 99.9%, okay, that there was no issue whatsoever of a horse, you know, not even breaking down, but just a horse actually not finishing a race and having to be, um, you know, escorted off of, off of the racetrack. So to me, that's, a, uh, and, and not just to me, but that was an improvement of over 30%, okay, from, from, from the previous year to year. So this, the, the phantom of Haiza and the actual realization of Haiza being implemented for the second half of the year definitely made a difference in safety and integrity. Um, and I think as an industry, that's what we want. Yeah, and, and honestly, the, the point that you make about expediency, to me, that is, that is the most important thing because, yes, you can, make, you can make the case that the provisional suspensions go too far. And I think logistically, there's, you know, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous to have someone move all their horses before the appeals process is complete. That being said, that to me, that's okay as long as the appeals process is expedient. And that's been the problem with racing all of these years is that someone gets a drug positive, it gets hung up in appeals and racing commissions. For six months, nine months, 12 months, sometimes over a year. I mean, we saw the nonsense with the Medina Spirit situation. I mean, nothing put a finer point on it, on our broken system than that and how long it took and how little transparency there was. So I was shocked like you when I saw the, the, the article in the, in the Blood Horse that 
you know, Ray Handel's situation was hand, handled, handled, Ray Handel's situation was handled in less than a week, in a couple of days. I was stunned right. to see the resolution happen so quickly. That is the system working. You know, you can, we can argue about the particularities of whether or not there should be shorter provisional suspensions and, you know, whether or not HISA should do this or that with this drug or that drug or that trainer. But as long as the appeals process is done in a time frame where everyone still remembers what the original offense was, then the system is working as designed. Roy Handel's allowed to train horses again. He had a reasonable proof of, of contamination. I don't know about the other couple of guys. And the other thing I'll say too is that no one that was busted so far is a guy that seems like a choir boy just from a handicapper standpoint. And I don't know. I'm not. I'm not on the back stretch with McLean Robertson or Jonathan Wong or any of these guys. All I can tell you, and I'm sure handicappers will back me up on this. All I can tell you is that nobody was surprised that those names came out as people who ran afoul of the Heiser rules. But right. as long as they're able to present an appeal in a timely manner and have their cases adjudicated in a timely manner, we are all good. And we're not. We're all good, but we're in so much better shape than we were before. And, and Joe, it's just because you mentioned, were you surprised by any of the names that were on the list? OK, and you can make you can make an argument either way. But what I'm still surprised about is, you know, there are still a number of trainers that I personally feel are taking an edge and are um, chemically enhancing their horses performances that haven't been even sniffed upon yet as far as, you know, so so whatever they're doing, either either. I and a lot of people who agree with the sentiment are way off base, and that could be, um, or the testing just hasn't caught up yet. But I like the progress that Heise is making. I like the fact that there's a specter of if you do something that's banned, and 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 that was something else I learned today. Also, is that there's almost two different um, two different branches. Okay, it's if there's um, an overage of an of a non-banned substance. There's a fine and and there's like a three strikes and you're out kind of situation. But if there's an overage of a band of any banned substance, that's where this harsh penalty comes in. And that's what we want as as owners and as horse players in the industry. You want to know that if somebody's you know taking advantage with a banned substance, somebody's cheating. Um, and and Lisa, again, went into great detail about um, the testing and how they could delineate um, whether something was a quote unquote um, contact contamination versus, a, you know, a real contamination. And in essence, you know, came, said, hey, if a, if a hot walker had done cocaine and still had a little bit of residual, um, you know, cocaine on, on his or her hands and they and they touched a horse, that's not going to come up in a positive. OK, uh, as, as, even as a as a contamination, they're going to have to, you know, ingest somehow the uh, the illegal substance in order for it to show up as a positive for a banned substance. So, again, as an owner, that made me feel much, much better knowing that they have the testing um, down to that kind of a science. And I think, like I, you know, I take your point. I think the, but the main thing is 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 swiftness and efficiency. Yes. Yep. The punishment can be swift as long as the appeals process is swift. As long as we're getting these things done in a swift and efficient manner, I think that 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 we're in such a better place. Let's move on. You know, I wanted to talk about that because it's it's you know it's it's important, especially as racing continues to adjust to this new era with Heisa in charge. But I wanted to just really quickly before we sign off talk about the horse of the year race because it's fascinating, and you know, there's no clear front runner at this point. And I think that that just that that makes for such a tasty second half of the year. And I liken it a little bit to the first year that we were on the show together, John, 2019. And we talked about this a bunch and bricks and mortar ended up winning the horse of the year trophy kind of by default. You know, bricks and mortar was a very, very nice horse, but he wasn't he wasn't a superstar. He wasn't a, a slam dunk horse of the year. But we're at that point now where it could be a turf horse up to the mark to me has run the by far the two most impressive turf races in America to this point in the Manhattan and the turf classic. But I think the sentimental favorite and Patty put up a poll on rail talk. If you follow us on rail talk on Twitter, Patty put up a poll for who you would pick for horse of the year, as we are recording here on July 12th and the overwhelming favorite, not surprisingly, I think was Cody's wish. And I think sentimentally, a lot of people want Cody's wish to win horse of the year. And I certainly would not be opposed to that. But I think the make or break race for him is going to be in the Whitney because he's been great in two races so far this year. He's going to stretch out to two turns in the Whitney. 
And I'm just, that to me is appointment viewing to see whether or not he can take that next step and become the leading older horse router, not just the best miler, but he's obviously the sentimental favorite. John, what do you think? To me, I would rank them up to the mark, slightly ahead of Cody's wish, just because I think up to the mark has beaten a little bit better fields, but they're kind of 1A and 1B for for right now. But there's time for a three-year-old to pop in the second half of the year, maybe win a grade one, maybe win the Breeders' Cup Classic. John, where do you have them stacking up right now? I I really think that that from a, you know, from a feel good story, Cody's wish is a horse that the industry is going to want to, to win. Um, and not just because of the, the story of how he was named and, and what's going on with that family. Um, but he's a really well-bred horse. I mean, he's a curlin out of a tappet mare uh, and, and he's campaigned by, by Godolphin. So, you know, that he's going to be a horse that uh, upon his career end, he's going to be a well sought after stallion prospect and people are going to want to breed to him. I mean, the horse was legitimately one neck away from winning 10 races in a row, Joe. I don't think, you know, I didn't realize that until I looked up his, his numbers again. And he's won, he's won four straight grade ones. Again, that's a phenomenal streak. Um, you can say what you want about who he ran against and, 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 you know, where he ran, but ultimately, you know, winning four races in a row at any level, is tough to do. Winning four grade ones at four different racetracks is nearly impossible. So he's also I, just not to interrupt, but he's also like a neck away from being like eight for eight or nine for nine, and is ten in a row. Know, he's, ten in a row. Yeah, yeah. he's a neck yeah. from from being ten in a row. Exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. I, I think I heard that before. Did I say oh, that? On the last I, said it. I just said oh. no. I just did it a minute ago. But thanks for listening. Did you? Sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> That's okay. I, I know you weren't. <laughs> it's late. It's late in the show, people. I will stop listening to John at about the forty-five minute mark. Not that I can blame you, Jeff. There's, there's no problem with that. I, I, you know, you're, you're a man of, t- of taste and integrity. Uh, I rely on the fans to tell me what John said. It's not, exactly. It's, yeah. Exactly. You, yeah. Usually they're overwhelmed with like all the nonsense. But here, here's, here's something else that I want to throw out there. Okay. So Forte on the Colt side, pretty mischievous on the, on, the, on the Philly side. If either one of them jumps up and wins the distaff for Pretty Mischievous or the Breeders' Cup Classic for Forte, you would have to make them, um, almost regardless of what else they do the rest, you know, in between, you almost have to make them the prohibitive favorite of being Horse of the Year because it's a classic distance and they're doing it against older horses, which is really, really difficult. If let's say that Cody's wish doesn't perform the way that, that everyone's hoping he does in the Whitney and he goes back to either doing, you know, one turn races or runs the mile and wins that. I still think that people are going to put more weight in the fact that pretty mischievous has won two grade ones already at Churchill and Belmont. And if she beats older Phillies, that's a really impressive feat. And Forte also, if it wasn't for a foot injury, you can make the case that not only would he have won either the Derby or the Preakness, but he would have been sound, uh, not sounder. He would have been um, fitter to be able to win the Belmont because really he almost won the Belmont off of that huge layoff and not being able to train for a long time. So I still think that if you're taking the, if you're giving the, the, the half year eclipse, we'll call it the equal. Um, it's only cause it's only half, you know, for halfway through the year, then not the lips? Yeah. what's that? Not the lips. No, not that. Then, then Cody's <laughs> wish it's, it's gotta be Cody's wish has gotta be the winner. What are you doing? Your Mick Jagger impression now? No, I just, I, I have, I have full lips. So I'm doing oh, okay. the, I'm doing the Joe lips. There you go. There you go. That's what everyone wants to see. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. All right. It's getting late. I told you it's, it's getting, getting late. late. It's getting late early here, Yogi. Um, anyway, so that's that's what I think. In a nutshell, that's what I think. Since people stopped listening, you know, including you, seven minutes ago. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm with you, and everybody's rooting for Cody's wish. And I think, in in general, to take it back to a serious note, I think everybody wants to see Cody Dorman on that Eclipse stage. To me, that'll be, you know, in what's usually a very long, boring, drawn out show. To me, that will that would be by far the highlight if he's able to win horse of the year, even if he wins champion older dirt mail or what are the other awards they have. I think that, that that's something everybody would look forward to. But yeah, there's a lot to lot to be determined. And, you know, this like I said, three year olds could pop up, but we're excited. Saratoga starting tomorrow on our way. So that was fun. I think we got a little something going here, Johnny Bananas. Uh, That was Rail Talk Episode 2. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to Steve Bick for coming on the show, my buddy, my pal. I know he's going to have a really busy Saratoga, as are all of you. And we're excited for Saratoga. Good luck, everyone, at this meet. Owners, trainers, bettors, 
everybody who's involved at Saratoga. We can't wait. Thank you as well to our producer, Patty Wolf. Our associate producer is Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. And thank you most of all to you, the listeners and the viewers, for tuning in. Couldn't do it without you. We'll see you back next week on Rail Talk. You're watching Rail Talk on YouTube. Appreciate you coming aboard, but make sure to like, comment, and subscribe below this beautiful visage right here to get all the new episodes and your notifications. We'll see you again soon on Rail Talk.